that we'll get going. So this is basically so we can check in, so we can ask questions, so we can all get on the right track. I wanna talk about the annotated bibliography and then I wanna talk about the LAMS essay. Um, so let's just go with that. The annotated bibliography, I wanna talk about topics you can um, explore and then the structure of it. Um, any topic that is a focused topic from Baron and Grimm is on the table here. And so your lenses are those topics. A lot of you are doing colorblindness um, or systemic oppression, systemic racism, this idea of whiting uh, writing right, writing white, so, sorry, I'm mixing up um, phrases, or acculturation, assimilation to white values, um, white culture. Those are things that are in Baron and Grimm that they're focusing on. And so if you focused on that in your lens essay and you feel like, yeah, I am, you know, like I'm understanding this really well, I wanna know a little bit more about it, then absolutely continue along that vein in your annotated bibliography, because I think that might make it easier for you. Um, are there any other topics here that um, you think that I should add to this list that you see in Baron and Grimm that you think would be useful. If you think of it as we go, go ahead and tell me because with Google Docs, I can Google Slides, I can add it to this list and it will be on Canvas on that link. So, you know, like I can make any changes to this to make it better or to make it more inclusive. And um, yeah. So this is writing and it is college writing, but I don't want this to be um, an assignment that is a difficult assignment. So when you're thinking about writing it, um, you can write it in a very informal tone um, or a very formal tone. I, I know some of you feel a lot more comfortable using an academic tone in your writing. And some of you go, hey, I just wanna write and, and I don't want that stress. I am totally fine if you want formal, informal, scholarly, or casual, if you wanna be introspective or reflective, which, you know, like in those journals that we do every single week, you're writing about really serious stuff about that you're learning about yourself. And if you wanna retain that kind of tone, that is totally fine. Um, but if you wanna write in, a more objective or authoritative way is like, this is what the scholars say. Um, that is also fine for me. Like this annotated bibliography is about learning more about a serious topic and relaying that to somebody else. That's my purpose. I just want you to say, over the course of the semester, I've learned about these things and here's some more stuff. That's all I want. So write with the voice that you want. Questions about what I mean by that. You actually have an assignment for this week related to the annotated bibliography. You're finishing up your essay and your assignment for this week 
is to go into the library database and find a source and share it. That's what the discussion board is about this week. Find a source, share a source. Um, what you'll be able to do is in your title, you can put color blindness or systemic oppression or systemic racism or assimilation, acculturation. I mean, like just put your topic into the title and then share the title of your source and who the authors are. Um, go ahead and share the search words, the search terms that you use to find it. And then a little bit of summary, you know, like here's what I learned. And, and in that way, it's possible that you might find a source that another student found. You might be able to use that source in your annotated bibliography or not, but this is, yeah, this is just sharing, okay? Questions about that assignment? Okay. So in this annotated bibliography, you're going to have an introduction. And your introduction might be a full page. Um, it might be two thirds of a page. It might be a page and a half. You know, like it's, it's, keep in mind the purpose of this annotated bibliography. So you're going to introduce your basic topic and define it. You know, like what is colorblindness? Um, in doing that, you can use definitions that you or a classmate put into the glossary um, definitions from Baron and Grimm, definitions from, um, I always mix up, Dees, Ozias, and Godby had in narrating conversational terms. But colorblindness is colorblindness. I want you, because you're narrowing the topic from just, just colorblindness to, um, Colorblindness in higher education, specifically literacy education. So define it and then analyze why it matters in higher education. Um, give an example. It might be graduation rates, which are lower for students of color in, an, in a higher education, um, statistically. Um, it might be your own personal story. Um, it might be the story of your family. It might be the story of a friend. Um, give an example. And then announce your plan for your, the paper. It's like, in this annotated bibliography, I'm going to look at this topic and I'm gonna look at it um, to see Starting with Baron and Grimm in 2002, I'm going to see how it may have progressed until now, which is 2021. Or I'm going to see how the problem has continued, even though it's 20 years later. Or I'm going to look at possible solutions or ways writing centers can um, address this problem. So, you know, like you're not building an argument. You're saying, I'm going to learn more. That is your purpose. Again, you can do this in a really complicated way, or you can be pretty straightforward. Um, I know personally, if I were told I could be straightforward, I would still want to be complicated because I am a complicated person. Um, but for some of you, you're going to want to say, you know what, we have three weeks to do this annotated bibliography, and I just want to get it in. I want to dial it in, and it's worth 200 points. And so, um, you know, like, I want to do a good job, but I have other papers I'm working on, so. Um, sources. Yes, you need sources in your introduction. You can use anything from the glossary. 
Um, you can use news stories. Um, I think I might want to open with, um, I think I might want to open with a story, whether it's the story of um, um, one of the people of color who have been killed, uh, the violence on um, Asians that's been in the news. I think I might want to open with that because that's a way of showing that these are current issues. We talked a little bit about exigency, showing that something matters, the so what. I think I'd open up with a current event. And then I'd introduce the topic. And so defining it from the glossary and then something that Baron and Grimm or Dee's Godby and Ozias say about it. And then I would just announce the plan for my paper. So that's what that introduction does. Any questions about the introduction? Um, I already put it in the chat, but I was curious um, how, how this differs from the literacy essay. This is more focused on the research. And so in your, um, in your transition, you may have done this work. And I'm fine with you borrowing anything from anything you've written, anything you've written all semester long. I'm fine with that, Hannah. Did, did that answer your question, Hannah? Um, so there's just more, we just include more research into yeah. this paper? Yes. Okay. Um, go ahead, Hannah, you had a follow-up question. Um, no, no, it's okay, yeah. Okay, I actually wrestled with this making, making it an extension of the literacy essay, like following up on the, on the lens, as in, you know, like now that I've looked at my own story through this lens, I wanna look at additional research. And I wrestled with that. And if you wanna do it that way, Hannah, I would be totally fine with that because it is an extension or it can be an extension of this essay. So, you know, like talk to me, message me um, if you want to do that. It would save you having to write an introduction. So, so that could be useful. And that would be true of any of you. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Sammy. Um, so for like this next assignment for the annotated bibliography, so we just write an intro and then is like the rest just the annotated bibliography or are we writing like a whole nother paper too? It's the rest is the annotated bibliography. Okay, got it. Yeah. And there's a lot of flexibility with how you wanna approach that um, because I want you to know more about these topics and I don't want this to be a complicated essay, if that makes sense. I have a question. Yeah, Emma? So what we're looking at right now, that's like the template for the annotated bibliography? Yeah. Okay. This, what, we're, what you're looking at right now on the screen, this is the introduction. You know, like the sources that you'll use. Oh, the introduction. oh okay. But is there, there like a template like that yeah, shows what on, you want from it? There is on Canvas and I can make, I can make a Google Doc template that, um, let me, uh, I, I know this sounds like I'm being sarcastic, but I'm not, I'm absolutely not, is like, I'm making a note. Let me make a note of this, Create, add, you know, like one more thing to do. No, um, a Google Doc template seems like a good way to go with this. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you suggested that, Emma. Because I don't want this to be 
a hard thing for you. Um, obviously, Hannah, if you did this as an extension of the um, of the lens essay, which I think is really poetic and beautiful, to do it that way, I just thought it might be more complicated. But if you do that, then you would not be using this. And seriously, it's the end of the semester. It's been a really hard semester and I am languishing. And I think you all are too. So um, we wanna be out in the sunshine. Unless we're like Sammy living in the Midwest. And yeah. Um, the body paragraphs. Um, introduce two to four published research articles. Um, and summarize what you learned about the focus. What claims does the author make relative to your topic? And what kind of evidence does the author provide? How sufficient is that evidence? I'm thinking the context of this. For example, Baron and Grimm are writing in 2002. So this is 20 years ago. They're writing at a university in Michigan, which is a PWI, that's a primarily white institution, and with a very small statistical presence of people of color. Um, and that tells us a lot. So San Diego State is a primarily white institution but it's very diverse. So I think last, I don't know, I, you know, like it's been a while um, since I looked up these statistics, but we're maybe 48% white at San Diego State, but the rest is divided up. So um, it's divided up. We're only about, four to five percent black at San Diego State, that's really, really small. Um, large, um, we are a Hispanic serving institution in HSI. So we have a large statistical presence of Hispanics. Um, and that gives you a good sense of what you'll find when you're back on campus in the fall. Um, but all of those things, that's context that helps you understand what are some of the things that we think about? What's the experience of the students? What's the experience in the writing center? What might you expect our writing center um, to be made up of? Um, like what kind of students would you see in your classroom? So all of this is context. Also what's going on right now, um, we are living in a pandemic and we are living in a time where an, a, a significant, we've just come through an entire summer of protests. We've just come through the rise of, I mean, like it was just like a week ago, there were some white empowerment um, protests or marches in Orange County in California. Um, you know, like these are all things that matter. So the year, the time, all of that matters. And that goes into these body paragraphs. Um, and then apply this, well, how, what does this mean to, how does knowing this about colorblindness matter? I want you to focus, I mean, like, yes, you're gonna have introduced the source. So that matters. But I want you to really focus on not summarizing the entire article, but what you learn about your topic, whether it's systemic oppression or colorblindness or the impact of acculturation or assimilation. Um, if, if you just wanna, you know, like you go, I only care if I earn a C. You, all, you only need two sources in this section. If you want to get an A, up that to four. 
Um, that's not guaranteeing that you're going to get an A, but you won't be able to earn an A without that. Does that make sense? That's more like contract. It's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Um, it's kind of like roller um, ice skating. When a trick is worth, all the tricks add up to 10 points. Diving. Yes, there's an Olympics this summer. Um, so you need anywhere from two to four scholarly sources. These are scholarly sources, not newspaper articles, magazine articles, and they are not encyclopedic sources or um, they're not encyclopedic sources. They're not dictionary sources. No, no references. Some of you, Hannah, I know in your glossary, and Elia, I think you included some of these things too. In the glossary, you had scholarly sources there on some of your topics. So if you, your um, scholarly, or if your annotated glossary, your annotated glossary, I'm mixing up all the terms. If your group glossary had these kinds of sources in it, pull from those. Um, but just keep in mind, do not use reference sources in there. Questions about that? Um, you can, if you used Baron and Grimm, in the introduction, you can use Dees, Ozias, and Godby in the body paragraphs and vice versa. So if you use Dees, Ozias, and Godby in the introduction to introduce your topic, you could use Baron and Grimm in the body. Does that make sense? And you can use news sources or personal experience as part of your analysis. I mean, like seriously, these are real world issues. Um, um, these are, oh, that bothers me enormously. I spelled the, I used, sorry. This is me just being editing as I go. Um, all these topics are related. So an author might write about colorblindness without ever using the word. They might talk about acculturation or assimilation without using those words. They might uh, use other words to describe an example, but you can see this through the lens of your topic. Um, colorblindness is a way of forcing people into the dominant culture, sadly. And so you might be writing about assimilation and what you're showing. You know, like they're using, you know, like the source is using the words colorblindness, but the example illustrates assimilation. These topics aren't just theoretical. So in your sources, as much as possible, find concrete examples. In your analysis of what you learn, apply it to your life um, or the news. This is real world stuff with real world impact. Make this as personal as you want or as objective as you want. You know, like just choose your own way of approaching this. You're gonna have a lot of flexibility in this. The reason why I didn't do, I ultimately opted not to require this as an extension of your lens essay is I didn't want you to worry about making it cohesive. Um, I wanted to allow you to be done with that essay if you wanted. And I wanted to allow you the opportunity to choose, to choose an entirely new topic if you wanted. And that's why I opted to do this. I also wanted this potentially to be an easier assignment. I, it, a much easier, it, it's definitely an easier assignment because it's basically finding sources through the databases reading them, looking specifically for your topic and just putting down what you learned. So your conclusion um, is gonna be a synthesis. 
is like taken together. You know, like yeah, I just looked at four sources on colorblindness. What did I learn? And why does it matter? Um, so so you, it might illustrate the problems that Baron and Grimm describe. It might clarify the problems Baron and Grimm describe. Um, it might clarify the experiences that you, the things that you've observed. You could compare and contrast what those sources describe. Um, you could look at cause and effect. You could demonstrate progress or lack of progress or even regression. Um, it was heart-wrenching this weekend to read about a school in North Texas where high school ninth graders were um, created a private social media account where they put dollar prices. It was slave trading. And I was like, oh my gosh, is our world getting worse? Um, I don't know, but you're like, see what you learn, see what you learn. Um, you, you, your research might also illustrate efforts to mitigate those problems. So um, that's what the conclusion is gonna do. Any questions about the body paragraphs or um, the conclusion? Some questions that I put that might be useful, are things better than they were in 2002? Um, has there been progress? Are things worse? Um, are any solutions being advocated? I mean, Baron and Grimm, in this article, they're advocating educating their tutors. Um, you can see the effects of this education. If you visited our writing center, um, does more need to happen? Yeah, definitely. Is it different at different universities? Depending on where we are, probably. Um, are universities changing? Um, I hope so. Are they, are they changing enough? What still needs to change? I mean, like these are questions that you can ask of as you're synthesizing what you learned. And um, you can synthesize them through any of these questions or questions that you want to ask. And I think that that would be fine. Any questions for me about the annotated bibliography? Okay. So the old essay, um, we've got 20 minutes 18, technically. And um, when you're finishing this up, think about E. Shelley Reed and 10 ways to think about writing. Um, show, don't just tell. Um, I'm seeing some good examples of, of that in the text, in your texts, but I'm also seeing a lot of telling. And as I'm going through and putting comments, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of that. I'm saying, don't just tell me, show me, give me some concrete examples. Don't assume readers know what you're thinking. Um, I see as you're transitioning, you're saying, you know, like, I learned a lot from reading Baron and Grimm. And tell me what you learned. Don't assume that I'm going to know exactly what you're thinking. Adapt to your audience. Meaning, you know, like, don't sound like you're, um, yeah, I mean, like, really think about who you're writing for. Create paragraphs. Don't just make, you know, like, one paragraph, two paragraphs. Change ideas. Um, more specifically, create a clever title. Um, you know, like, that, if this isn't just a lens on my literacy. This is, because that doesn't tell me what I'm looking at. Be creative. You'll notice in the rubric, you get points for that title. Um, create a really strong hook. Um, 
stay away from, imagine you're doing this, or have you ever wondered? Uh, yeah, like just put us in this story. Think about what the essays we read at the beginning of the semester. Um, as you're writing, answer those how, how, why questions. Concrete examples, I may have said that. Um, reflect on what you learn. Look at context for quotations and guide your audience. Um, this is the transition from one of your essays. And this is a short paragraph that functions as a transition. Reflecting on my best memory in my senior year creative writing class was big for me. I kept wondering why I had never tried to recreate what I had loved so much. Um, some context, this is the author's grandmother creating sweet potatoes, Korean sweet potatoes. And the author says, I wondered why I don't eat sweet potatoes anymore and why when I call my grandma in Korean, it's harder to communicate than it was when I was five never really occurred to me that I was rejecting a part of me, a huge part that not only made me happy, but unique. As I read this, it left a suspenseful feeling. What I didn't realize, however, was that people around me had similar experiences. So similar, in fact, that the term acculturation was formed. As I reflect on my experiences, I am now able to understand that what I was experiencing was acculturation, and therefore it made sense to look through that lens to not only validate, but to compare my experiences to others. The term acculturation is widely used in the article addressing racial diversity in a writing center by authors Nancy Butteron and Nancy Grimm. In their narrative, they give examples of their experiences as literacy educators and how their awareness of their own colorblindness allowed them to address acculturation that they realized their students had felt. After reading about their perspectives as educators, I was able to relate to their epiphanies of what I found their marginalized students were feeling and therefore was able to understand my own struggle as a biracial student who felt no belonging. What I really like about this is the two-part process. It's like the authors reflecting on their experience and reflecting on, and then that reflection results in a word. I found other people had this and there's a word for what I was experiencing that I never had a name for before. And that's a really powerful thing. And so they can introduce that to their audience. Any questions on what this student does? Is this an example for the literacy essay or the annotated bibliography? Yeah, I've completely switched to the literacy essay. Oh, okay. okay. I, I, I may not have done that transition entirely well, Hannah, given that you missed it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did it. Um, dang, that, that just made everything a um, little less effective. I'm really sorry about that. No, it makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wow, what is she even talking about? Ah. Um, oh, man, I would have really picked up on that if we were in a classroom. I'm getting increasingly excited about being in classrooms. So I hope you all are, are you all are too. Um, although I've enjoyed meeting with you. Um, on Zoom, I really have, but dang, I miss classrooms. Um, any other questions about this two-part transition? I, I wanna uh, just really quickly um, jump to my own, I mean, this is mine. 
And I, I really struggled with this. And I'm going to give you, a, you know, like, I want you to do your best. One of the things that I did, because I, I, um, I put, and, and at least one of you did this also. Um, I think we thought of it separately. Two parts to the essay. I put part one, colon, why does literacy matter? Um, and I just like, here's my inquiry question. I've got two parts to this essay. I think I can help my readers if I name them. It's just like, boom. Um, so I was really happy with that. You'll notice my title, Literacy, colon, Entering a Technicolor World, is really, um, really, really helpful. I thought I was going to talk about productive diversity, and I ended up focusing on the colorblindness. The more I wrote, the more I realized that lens made more sense for my story and why literacy matters. And then when I got to the second part, um, I put part two and I just named it, examining my story through a lens of colorblindness. And I transitioned a little differently than the student you read did. Um, but you'll see some similarities. The process of examining and exploring, you'll see me reflecting. The process of examining and exploring how literacy, reading, writing, absorbing stories about people from around the world, past and present, has shaped me, has forced me to pull up memories long forgotten, and has revealed the power of literacy in my life. What stories do we read? Whose stories do we read? Who tells those stories and from what perspective? And how do I retell those stories to myself? Clearly these stories are powerful because narrative provides a way to speak things otherwise unspeakable, to give voice to that which would otherwise go unheard. In essence, when we tell stories, when we listen to stories, we discover truths, truths that we might not otherwise see. In telling this story, I began to recognize how my awareness of cultures and my respect for diversity shifted when I moved from Hawaii and my neighborhood filled with diverse tastes, sounds, and colors to Colorado, where my white culture was so normal that I stopped being aware of it and assumed everything was, everyone was like me. This is what is known as colorblindness or the habit of pretending not to notice color because it doesn't or shouldn't matter. Writing Center scholars, Nancy Baron and Nancy Grimm explored the effects of colorblindness in higher education and literacy education in their color, um, in their article, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the rest of this essay, I use their observations about colorblindness as a lens through which to learn more from my own literacy story. So you'll see that I'm doing some really similar things to what um, this student is doing, um, reflecting on my story, naming the lens, defining the lens, and moving right into what I'm gonna do. Any questions about this? Here is that student's first body paragraph. And I wanted you to see how a student is applying the lens. Um, you'll notice the very first sentence, although there is qualifying, you know, it's saying they're talking about writing centers, but I'm using their ideas to look at my own life. Although their story was specific to writing centers, its message is applicable to all aspects of the American school system. As Baron and Grimm say, bilingual students are supposed to write as though English were their only language. Bicultural students are supposed to interpret what they read from the perspective of mainstream culture. And you'll notice that ellipsis there. Um, an ellipsis is a fancy way of saying the dot, dot, dot. And Baron and Grimm talk about bi-dialectical, bilingual, and they talk about a lot of things which were not relevant 
to this student's story. And so this student deleted those, didn't change the meaning, it just narrowed the focus. And this is the power of doing that in a quotation. The author doesn't have to worry about those ideas, can just focus on the part that's relevant. Again, the author has not changed Baron and Graham's point. They've just cut the quote to make it relevant. My cultural students are supposed to interpret what they read from the perspective of the main cult stream culture. This stood out to me because I am both bilingual and bicultural, and yet most of my adolescence was spent trying to convince myself that I wasn't. What I learned was that this rejection of my Korean side was not only a result of where I grew up, but what I was learning in school every day in school. It was taught that to be successful, one must assimilate themselves to the mainstream culture, going back to that quote, which in my case was American. My process of assimilation involved letting my Korean flashcards collect dust in my closet and begging my mom for a turkey on Thanksgiving day. Now you do not know this, but see these concrete details? This are These concrete details are part of the student's narrative. And so the student is using specific details and applying the lens to those specific details. And what I now know, while I do take some of the blame for rejecting part of myself, my schooling supported having a feeling of belonging rather than a feeling of uniqueness. The student continues with that in the next paragraph, but I knew I wouldn't have time for that. And so this is all that I've shared. So let me stop the share because this is the last slide and ask you, what questions do you have? So those are two you know, like I've shown you part of my essay. Um, I, I want to open this up um, and I've compared and contrast my transition with this student's transition. What, and you can see there are some similarities, but there are some differences. What are some strategies you are using for your transition that you think might be helpful to other students as they watch this video? Okay, then any other questions or things you wanna to add to this? Will we see our um, corrected rough draft before we'll have time to turn in our final draft? You will see it by tomorrow. So yes, um, you also, I don't, you know, like you always have an extra week this is due Saturday, um, but you always have an extra week. And so if you wanna use that time um, to visit me during office hours or conference times and get that additional feedback, um, please do. Some of you are just gonna say, I'm so done with this. She's promised she will be lenient. I'm gonna trust that. Um, yeah. Uh, does that answer your question, Riley? Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. And remember, extra credit for going to the Writing Center. That's 10 points of extra credit. That's the same as five. That's a, a five point bump on this grade, by the way. I looked also, points. sorry. I looked for the extra credit for April. It, will that be up on the, because I only saw March when I was looking on the home page um i thought i thought it was on there but it may not be um i know some people have found it 
Uh, I just looked on the home page and then under the writing center module. You're right. It it's March. not, Riley. I know some of you have found it by just clicking past March, but I'll put it on the home page. That was okay. um, that was an error on my Thank part. Thank you. And it's there. And I want you to get those points. I really want you to get those points. Any other questions related to this? Okay. It's um, 11. Oh, I, oh, yeah, Hannah. I, I just wanted to clarify um, that also with essays, like, do we still have that one grace, one day grace period? With essays, you get a one week grace period. Oh, oh, so that's what you, that's what you meant. Yeah, you, I, I mean, like essays are big. They're a big part of your grade. If something's worth five points, you know, like, it's just do it. But these, these matter. And I know they matter to you. I know your grades and your GPA, you know, like that's something that a lot of you are thinking about. And I want to give you time to get that extra help. So yeah, Hannah. It's a week. I'm I glad you asked. Probably, yeah, I could probably say this for the whole class, but um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, it's it's my pleasure. I I appreciate that some of you are taking that extra time. It's been a tough semester. In in some ways, this is easier than spring, but in some ways, it's harder. I think um, I think we're all just really worn out. We are languishing to go back to that New York Times article. Um, and I think we can support each other. I think students can support instructors and instructors definitely should support teachers. So I think it's, yeah. Um, any other questions before um, we close this out? It's 11.51, if you wanna go um, you can, otherwise I'll just sit here and talk to you until you all are gone. All right, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Bye, Riley. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna turn off the recording. Hi, Sophia, how are you?